Welcome to the official topic talk. Please like, share, and subscribe. Audio jungle. Steve, I heard you're a bit of a bad boy back in the day. <laughs> right? Um, I seen your subject access request. You're a clean guy in regards to there's no beastie activity on that. But you you do have a life, mate. You were in that world, should I say. Do you want to do you want to talk about when you first started to turn into a bad boy? <laughs> I mean, in no means I don't glamorize crime in I don't glamorize crime in any way, shape or form. I mean, um we've all probably done something wrong in our in our life. Um, except probably um you know, I've had a, an exciting part of my life. Um you know, where I've got myself into a bit of trouble. I mean, one that I can talk about um, was when I got done for firearms. And when, 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 I, got, when I got done for this, for, for the firearms, I mean, um, I realised straight afterwards, um, you know, when you go to a job interview, you know, and then you've got to explain to that new employer, you know, um, about having a firearms charge on, on your record. Um, I used to go to the interview. I used to be happy until when he <laughs> says, oh, criminal record. And that's when I used to just get out of the chair and run out the door because it's hard to explain um, a firearms charge, you know, because people would expect you to do a bank robbery or... Um, physically going out to harm somebody or using the gun in that in the mannerisms that um to threaten somebody i mean in my case i was working as a, a security guard in telford for about probably about nine years and um, i was specialized on building sites in telford and back then, it was uh, in the town Shrewsbury that, that we had a contract with. And it was for um, um, a show home on a construction site. And people would sit back and think, oh, what, you know, there's nothing to rub off a, a, a building site. I mean, you've got, you got the dumper trucks, you've got, you know, um, diggers and stuff like that. But... What we were actually protecting was the show home. Um, the show home was probably worth probably about one hundred and eighty-nine thousand pound. You know, is, is, is if, if you had gone on to the site. You know, what year was this? <coughs> um, nineteen ninety-seven, and. Like I said, I spent nine years as a security guard um, in the Telford area, and um, they put me on the site in Shrewsbury. Now, what had happened the night before, um, the guard that was on duty the night before, um, he got beat into a fucking pulp um, by four guys that just leapt out of a transit van. With baseball bats and i mean they've done a really bad number on him and the poor guy ended up in hospital for about six months um and they stole roughly about 80 grand's worth of stuff so what i remember the next morning i got a phone call um saying would i go to this Shrewsbury site um and i said yeah yeah no one you know you know stick, stick me down for Shrewsbury tonight so when i went through to the other lads i, I said here yeah, didn't you not get asked to uh go up to Shrewsbury yeah yeah but fuck that the place got done over last night i went oh well no no worries now they, they dropped me off on the site. I think it was uh, about five o'clock and then the construction workers normally go home at R5. 
so I sat down, filled out, filled out the logbook, and went round on me on me patrol. Um, all the construction workers, have, you know, left the site, so I locked up all the gates and secured the compound. And we were in a, it was like a hut, um, which was roughly about probably about 300 meters from the gates. And anyway, as the night went on, it was, it was all, you know, it was all quiet. And I thought to me, so, you know, each time I went back to the hut, I'd, I'd never sit down. I was always peering out the windows and, you know, because of what happened the night before. So anyway, it came to 12 o'clock at night. And all of a sudden, this fucking white transit van burst through the fucking gates of the site. And made its way up towards the hut, which I, at that point I was sitting in the hut. And the van stopped halfway between the gates and the hut where I was sitting. And I was like, oh, fuck, here we go. Um, on that occasion, I had no, I, I had no radio. I didn't have a mobile phone. And the nearest, and the nearest phone box was about a mile, about a mile away from the site. Did you have a car? Didn't have a car. Back back then, they dropped me off at the site, and it was my own stupidity. Um, I didn't pick up a radio from out. And how did you, how did you get home? Um, they they came and picked us up in the morning. Like they dropped us off at the site, um, and then picked us up in the morning. You know when our shift finishes. And you know I I knew full well. You know I should have picked a radio up. You know at, at the least. You know, considering it was a high risk site then, because of what had happened the night before. Well, anyway, this man's halfway between the gate and the hut. So me being me, I fucking took took a piece of paper and a pen, and I came out of the hut door, and I sneaked up to the up to the tranny van, and they didn't spot me. I wrote down the registration. I dropped a piece of paper so I had to write the registration on the end. And then I sneaked all the way back to the hut and I went through um, the logbook from the night before. And I matched the registration on my hand to the registration that was it written in the logbook from the night before. So at that point, I thought, oh, fuck. What do I do? Well... Just at the back of the site um, is where one of my mates was living, and that's where I was staying for two nights. Um, because all I literally have to do is hop over the fence, and I'm basically on site. So anyway, I've hopped over the fence, gone in the house, jumped back over the fence, and gone back to the hut. Well, lucky for me, the guys, the occupants in the van, didn't see me, because I took took my Ibis coat off, and I put my black coat on. And all of a sudden, anyway, this van fucking well spent straight up to the fucking hut. So I, I know what I've just picked up. <laughs> I've come out of the doors, and um, I've, I've gone up towards the, the driver's side, and there was like a, you know, the sliding doors on the side of the van. That was just about to open. So I've managed to hold, hold it shut. And then the driver's door was about to open. Well, all of a sudden, I've held back on, on, like, pushed back on the driver's door to shut it. I produced a fucking gun in my hand and put it straight to the driver's head. And I said, do you want to fuck to you, mate? I said, get the fuck off my sight. And to me, I thought, fuck. Well, to my relief, the fucking van wow spun off the fucking site back out through the gates. Um, and he went straight to the phone box, which was a mile away, phoned the police. Bearing in mind, they, they've just come to rob the site to take the uh, other 100 grand's worth of stuff. Picked up the telephone to, uh, and they called the police and said the security guard's got a gun. They phoned the police on you? Yeah. 
<laughs> they went straight to the phone box, which was a mile away, and phoned the police and said the security guard's got a gun. So I started walking, walking back to the hut, and I pissed myself laughing. <laughs> Fuck you now. So not, not only are the scumbags robbing a building site, but they're grasses too. Yep. And I mean, um, I was walking back to the hut and I was absolutely pissing myself laughing. You know, because I couldn't believe what had just happened. So anyway, no sooner had I got in the hut and I started writing the report, um, there was probably about five or six police vehicles crashed through the fucking site. <coughs> came, came, came from all directions on the site. Well, between that and going back in the hut, I've chucked the gun into, there, there was like a big, massive metal, metal, um, like bin. So I've lobbed the gun into that bin, gone into the office and started writing out the report, you know, to say that, um, the, the transit van had just burst onto the site. And, um, there was probably about five or six police cars that swarmed onto this site. Well, I've come out of the hut pissing myself laughing, you know. Um, and I've seen the car doors of the, these police cars fucking open. I could see them duck behind and, you know, they had weapons trained on me. And then all of a sudden there was a big spotlight fucking, you know, that shone straight into my face. I couldn't see anything. So I'm like, this is pissing myself laughing. What the fuck's going on here? Well... Then, then they were shouting, uh, get down on the floor, get down on the floor. And I'm like, what the fuck? Are you so fucking joking? This is your final warning, get down on the floor. <coughs> I'm like, fuck. So anyway, I don't, I've, I've, I've had no choice but to sink straight to the fucking floor. And um, the armed officers come, come running up, handcuff me behind my back and... Um, Pulled, pulled me up, up, up onto my feet, and um, they, where's the gun? Where's the gun? I'm like, what fucking gun? <laughs> what gun? What are you talking about? And it was at that moment, um, a sniffer dog went straight to the fucking bin and just sat down in front of the bin. And the officers pulled pulled the bin down, and. They were just about to put me in, into the back of the police car and they, they pulled the bin down and they searched in, searched in, and then they found um, it was a war of a PPK. Um, so is that, is that one of those old style guns? It's he's, 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 he's currently does a women's handgun. It's like really small. You've got... Um, you got seven bullets in the um, magazine, or um, you can have an extended magazine, um, which holds, I think it's about 17. So, I mean, I mean, you can fill it in the palm of your hand. I mean, if you Google a war for PPK, um, it's an automatic. Um, if you Google what? it, you'll see it will fit in. I, I mean, you can place it like that in your hand. Well, what I'm thinking is, Steve, what I'm, th what I'm thinking is here, obviously the cops let you away with that. You were robbed, you're a security guard, and you don't have a telephone, so you can't call them. You're miles away from any, any help. Obviously, they believed you. The thing, like, they arrested me, um, took me down to the station, and obviously they interviewed me, and I um, said to them exactly what had happened. I said the night before... This gang had put the guard in hospital for a good six months. I said it's in the legal document in, in the logbook that, that we have to write in. Um, that's actually used as a legal document if or when um, the people go to court. And I explained to him exactly what had happened. You know, that um, I took the registration of the van, matched it against... Um, the registration that was in the logbook I knew then it was going to be trouble and the mistake that I made was jumping over the fence producing the gun 
to use as a deterrent. And the way I explained it to the police. What? I, what? I, explained, I explained it to the police. I used the gun as a deterrent. And I actually used this phrase, um, like a scarecrow in a field, they deter birds. I used this gun to deter these crooks from stealing the £100,000 worth of stuff. Well, needless to say, um, they charged me. And I ended up, um, my, my solicitor said I'd be lucky to get like three, you know, if I get three years out of this, I'd be lucky. I went, I went, you're fucking joking. I said three years. They said, yeah, because, because you used a gun. Um, Are you serious? Absolutely. I mean, but there is a twist to the towel. Um, so Dirty and, and grass and went, robbers, we went, aren't they? We went to court. And they even had the audacity to turn up a court to give evidence against me. What? <laughs> but the Hold police on. never once went to arrest them for putting the guard um, in jail. Did your employer, when you, uh, just a question, sorry. Your employer obviously believed you. Uh, well, obviously, the, the managing director, the supervisor and the manager all came to court. I'm, um, this is no joke, Steve. If that had see if that happened in Ireland in 1997, somebody those two fell, them people that grassed you up are getting their legs blown out like because that is some of the most dirtiest grass and shit that I've ever heard in my life. I mean, at the time, I was like, you can imagine what I was shouting go fucking arrest them. They're the ones that stole 80 of grand's worth last night. Now they've come to steal a hundred thousand pounds worth of stuff. I was doing my job. Mate, you know, but if I you had correctly, I should not have used a gun. But then, what was I supposed to do? You know, was but I mate, supposed if to you... take a battery and then take the hundred grand's worth of stuff and me get fired? <laughs> no, no. The thing about it, the thing about it is right. First off, you pro you probably should have had a radio on you, right? Second off, if you hadn't have grabbed that gun, would they have used it on you? Because they're That's dirty. The I mean, they, they each had a baseball bat. There was four you, of them. You know they're dirty grasses, right? Because they've just done that, and you? You know they're willing to come in and and steal that. More than likely, they're willing to get rid of somebody just to get what they want. So they're that way inclined. So you've done the right thing, I think. I think the only thing wrong you've done there was not bring a radio with you. And I think in that situation, the best thing you could have done was just write down the reg registration and run. Well, when it, when it all went to court um, on the trial, um, you know, there was a lot of mitigating circumstances when it came down to sentencing um, that was used because um, my solicitor said to me, look at three years, you know, anything less is going to be a bonus. And the mitigating circumstances um, that was involved um, as to why I didn't get three years um, and I got 12 months um, was, A, I was actually a security guard in, in, in a position um, to protect the property. I wasn't going out of my way to cause somebody trouble, you know, or to rob somebody or, you know, to threaten somebody's life as such as for a gain. Now, the second mitigating circumstances were that they turned up the night before um, and stole £80,000 worth of stuff. Now, my employer had to take um, some responsibility in this because um, he didn't make sure that I had a radio or a phone or any means of communicating. You know, so he had to take um, some blame as to my action um, because he should have made sure my welfare was taken care of. So given given the mitigating circumstances um, and the judge did realise that, um, you know, they did rob the site the night before. Um, in, in, in the end up, um, after a week, I got, I got 12 months imprisoned for it. 
and that was because um i used a gun if i'd done anything else then i would have got away with whatever else um if i picked the brick up and hit him you know i would have got away with all of that but because but I it was that, their gun it was their weapon they showed up to intimidate you did they get any present time well yeah um <clears throat> the twist of the story was um when i received my sentence we we my managing director the manager the supervisor put a counter a counter in against them so while i was doing my first two weeks in prison um the managing director had gone to the police they had all the evidence they needed you know from my trial that it was them that robbed the site the night before um they all three got arrested um two weeks after i, I was in uh starting my sentence um they got arrested um they got put in front of the judge they got charged um, and they ended up doing, I think it was five to seven years each. Brilliant. Brilliant. Good you job. Know, that, that was, the, that, that was the, the, the twist in, in the story. And basically the judge did say to me, and I had to be careful um, when I was on the stand to the words I was using. I couldn't stand in front of him and say I wanted to scare him. You know, I had to use the word deter. That was something my solicitor pumped into my brain. He said, you use the word deter, right? And an example, like a scarecrow's in the field to deter birds, you use the gun to deter them. Or or what would have been even better, I, I think, in the moment I didn't realise it was either fight or flight, and I've never been put into that situation before where guys roll up with a gun and weapons. I thought I was going to be harmed, and at that moment I thought I was doing the right thing. I mean, literally, the only thing that I'd done wrong um, was produce was produce the, the the gun, basically. And let's face it, mate. He the judge was... asked me. The judge asked me. He said, um, "Play back the scenario." He said, "Would you do the same again?" <laughs> oh shit! Oh shit! <laughs> so, oh um, shit! So I I, I looked I looked at me looked at me managing director like that, you know, and I thought, I know what I want to say. You know, and I was going to say, mm. yeah, I fucking would. You know, but my heart was telling me, look, you know, you would do the same, but this time you'll make sure you'd have, I'd have the radio for communicating so I could call the mobile patrol and then they would then deal with it with the police. You know, I, I, I said I would do it exactly the same, but without the gun. And you I should have been given a medal, mate. You should have been given a fucking medal. No, uh, uh, giving you 12 months in prison. That judge is an absolute arsehole. He should have said, get this man out of court. And do you know what? He deserves, uh, give this man a raise and uh, give him compensation and we'll and pay for him to go on a holiday. He's just, he's just saved the building site from 100 grand and caught three notorious robbers and they're trying to grass him up well, under no circumstances. I mean, the managing director and the manager and the supervisor, um, they all turned up at court in their full uniform with like their pips and badges and, you know, they wore medals on, on the jacket and everything. And um, they were asked, um, would I be re-employed, you know, when, when I do come out? Fucking right. All, all, all of them gave me a glowing reference and they said, we're taking him on without a fucking shadow of a doubt. Um because he's just saved us a hundred thousand pounds off our insurance um yeah, claim. Yeah. all right they, they didn't agree with me using a gun obviously um they hadn't trained me to do that i'd done that out of instant all right i knew it was wrong i shouldn't have done that you know but what else could i have done in that situation other than let him rob the whole site put me in hospital like the other guard um you know, so that, that's just like one twist, you know, in, in my life story. And um, tell me, tell me, how did, explain to us how prison went, how, what was prison like for you? Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't my first time, I think. I think I've only been in prison three times and that was my second uh, sentence. And uh, I, I knew to the routine, I knew, you know, what to expect, you know, and, 
um, you know, how prison prison life is. And I mean, they put me into a uh, like remand prison first, um, which is the one that I've done the video on, um, which was the uh, prison in Shrewsbury, where they put you in there for about a month and then they allocate you, um, you know, to another another prison for you to finish off like your sentence. <laughs> and I think on that occasion, um, I got allocated to Stafford, to Stafford Nick. Um, so I would only do half of the sentence. Um, so basically, I, I, that I was in jail for six months, basically, from the 12 month sentence, because you only do half. And I'd already done a month on the remand jail. So I knew I only had five months, you know. Um, but anyway, in, in, in Stafford jail, um, there was one particular incident I do remember. And it, it, it kind of made me laugh because um, back then there was um, a guy who won the lottery called Lee Ryan. And he was fucking, and, and he was in Stafford Nick. <laughs> and uh, one day we were going from the cell block to the library, which is like a little short walk. And um, you go past like an exercise yard. And on the way to the library, I recognised him, you know, as, as being Lee Ryan, the, the fucking lottery winner. And there he was on a fucking sunbed like that, just fucking, you know, just, just laying and chilling, thinking, fuck me. You know, as soon as I'm out of here, I've got a fucking million pounds to go to. Um, you know, so we, I, I bumped into him, you know, out of the well, I went, fucking hell, you're a lucky sod. How, how long you got left? I, was, I think he was serving two years. For what? Um, I do believe it was a, a robbery. Did he get the million pound out of the robbery? Well, when when he got, he, he got um, <coughs> I think I, I think he earned some money from that. I mean, but when he got released from jail, he had his lottery winnings, you know, to live on. So he was living a life of Riley in jail for the last like three months of his sentence, knowing full well he was going out to a, you know, like a life of luxury. Mate, that's dangerous though. It depends what prison you're in. Like I'm thinking to myself, if I if I was a guy that had nothing to lose. And I know this. I know this cunt here's got a million in the bank. I'm going to extort as I'm going to take as much of that person as possible. Not saying I would, but I'm just saying particular. Like if I'm in that way, if I'm not way inclined, I'd be thinking to myself, I'm going to take as much off this fella as possible. Especially if you if you don't have much getting out yourself. I mean, um, I think I think another in, another incident that I think was really really funny, and I hit the. Um, the front page, <laughs> you know, of the local paper for this one. And uh, I don't think anybody in the world's ever done this, but um, I'm trying to think what, what I've done wrong. Um, <laughs> in every situation, you've done nothing wrong, Steve. Steve. Um, every situation you've went to prison, you've done nothing wrong. You've always been the hero. I think, I think it was something like misuse of electricity. I mean, I, I, I wired... Um, um, a few cables from like the outside lamppost into a, a dance hall because I hired the hall but I didn't hire it with electric so <laughs> I've used the fucking lamps out on the street to power to power out disco equipment and um, that was the charge anyway and uh... <laughs> <laughs> how long did you get for that well it, it's quite funny because um just just as the, the judge was about to pass sentence, you know, I was you know, when you stand up and then the judge passes sentence to you. Well as I stood up, the judge was just about to pass sentence, my phone rang. Oh shit. I took the phone out of my pocket, I said, Hold on, sir, and I answered the call. <laughs> and it was from um at the time it was one of my lady friends. What's happened, Steve? I don't know. I'm just about to get sentenced. I'll phone you back after. Oh shit! That's me. That's priceless. That's priceless. So, I mean, the 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 place was in stitches. Was the judge and laughing? The judge, and the judge looked at me. He said, 
I need to rethink this. And he went back back out through his fucking doors. Um, we all sat what down. What a wanker. Like... My solicitor said to me, he said, he said, he said, fuck's sake. He said, what a wanker of a judge. I could take, you take a bit of crack with that. Like, you know, you, you, you didn't murder somebody. Like, you, you took a phone call. You didn't mean to. It rang. Okay, you were stupid to answer the call. But, I mean, judges, this is the problem, right? Judges are too far detached away from the actual people. Do you know what I mean? They're just, that's that's funny to me. For me, maybe I couldn't be a judge. If somebody done that to me, I'd probably lessen their sentence just for making the fuck, making the day. Do you know what I mean? Well, I mean, this guy was ruthless. I mean, what did you, he, went out, did you get? He, he went out with a bad temper and he came back and his face was just red. <laughs> you can see the anger. Um, he said, right. Um, so I stood up. He said, right. He said, I was going to give you um, probation and community service. He said, I was then thinking about a six month sentence. So I'm still there thinking, come on, just fucking get on with it. You know. <laughs> and yeah, even, even my solicitor had a grin on his face. He thought, he thought, yeah. he thought you, you fucking idiot. And yeah. anyway, the judge turned around. He said, look, he said, because you've answered the phone in my courtroom, he said, I'm going to double your sentence. I went, you're fucking joking. <laughs> and in the end, up, he, he gave me um, three months when really he was going to give me like six months probation and for that i and and to make it even more comical as i was walking away i was shouting out thank you sir thank you sir <laughs> well <coughs> i'm gonna be amused to me in the, in the paper the next day it was right on the front page man answers phone just a sentence was about to be passed and oh man that would be great to get that he gets double the sentence, and I mean, um, on that occasion, I, I I went into the prison, um, and I was out within two days, you know, because I'd done um, two months on remand. So if you get three months, you only do a month and a half. But because I'd done two months, I basically completed the sentence. You're you a know, lucky and... bastard, you are. <laughs> I mean, I don't glamorize crime. I mean, but this this is, you know, um... it's funny crime, Steve. Not the gun one, but this one. That's funny crime. And th <clears throat> to be honest with you, it's harmless. Do you know what I mean? Mm. It is harmless. Like it's that's 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 a bit of crack. To be honest with you, and judges are too far detached away. That's to me. Fuck, you know what I mean? That's it's a bit of crack. It should have brightened up his day. You know, he's <laughs> judges are. Judges are dickheads, do you know what I mean? See what, yeah. see what it was back then. Um, you know, and incidentally, I haven't, I haven't been near a police station for fucking hell, about 13, 14 years now. And um, back then, there was two particular judges. There was one in the magistrate's court, and there was one in the... Um, you know, the next court up, you've got the magistrates, and then you've got the crown. Crown Court, yeah. Yeah. The one the one in Telford was somebody called Browning. Right? And there was a judge in the Crown Court at Shrewsbury, Manders. Judge Manders. The most two evilest bastard judges, right? You could ever imagine. Whenever I got put in front of them, for some reason, um, I don't think they liked me. You know, because they always gave me the top end of the fucking sentencing like sort of scale you know that suited the crime and um a story now about the uh, manders top judge in in shrewsbury crown court i mean he's re he's long retired now but what he used to do in the morning right he'd, he'd have all the cases you know that that he's got to see and he'd sit at home eating his breakfast right and they put a figure in his mind <coughs> right so what he used to he'd be eating his breakfast and say for argument's sake he come up with 180. now when he got into work in, in in into the crown court if he had 11 cases to see that day right he would divide the 180 
right, between the 11 cases, and that's the amount of years he was going to give to each hockey person. And he would sit there at his laptop like this, you know, at his laptop for like years. Like I'll a, never sn- forget, like I'll a never snidey forget. little nonce judge that he is. He was the worst one. I mean, but somebody got retribution on him because... Um, he, he looked somebody up for, um, I do believe the guy was a fucking smack rat. And Manders gave him about three years in jail for um, aggravated house burglary. Right, right. And when this particular guy um, got out, I didn't agree with this, but I found some of it amusing. He burgled <laughs> Judge Manders' home. <laughs> that's, mate, that's brilliant I love no, it mate, I, I, I swear to God I... yeah, yeah but he didn't stop there He fucking He shat and pissed all over Manda's fucking bed <laughs> That is Mate listen now, I, That's the best <coughs> smack head I've ever heard of See see, the thing was With man, with Manda's um, His son was hooked on heroin Now if you went in front of him for anything to do with drugs, especially heroin, he was sending you away for like double the sentence that you should receive. Now, they 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 called this guy obviously on DNA, DNA evidence, and this guy's lived a living legend, you know, for the rest of his life in Telford and Shrewsbury. Um, but when he got put in front of Manders, you could imagine what happened. Manders gave him nine years just for burgling his house. How was he able to take that case? Is that not a conflict of interest? Well, that's what we were all saying back in the day. But for some reason, um, they, they they allowed that. Now, that was something we could never understand. That's like a he manslaughter charge. charge. That, that, that was a big big conflict of, of interest. I mean, I do remember um, the guy did go, go to an appeal, obviously on that purpose. Um, and I think his, his sentence was reduced to something like 18 months. Um, and then I First believe, off. I do believe like five years after that, Manders retired. First off, there's the old saying, the judge's son is the worst cunt imaginable because you always hear it. Like I, I knew a lot of boys lived, there was a Protestant area away from me and the, the cop's son was always the one that ended up the criminal. He was always the one, or she was always the one, ended up on drugs or the criminal, because they just lived the, they just lived that life. And the fact that his son was a heroin addict, and the fact that ironically he would be burgled by a heroin addict, and then shot and pissed on by a heroin addict, and then ironically, and not not so ironically, but it was set up that he was going to be the judge for that guy's court case and then give him nine years which you get seven years for manslaughter it just shows you okay he shouldn't have burgled him and it was bad what he done but karma is a bitch if you are bad to people that comes around to bite you in the ass and at the end of the day the guy got 18 months done half of that and you know he appealed it done half of that and you know manders at the end of the day his legacy is is the guy that got his house shot and pissed on and robbed by a heroin addict I mean, that's because something he, that. Yeah. I mean, the guy's a fucking legend. He always will be a legend till the day he dies. A lad that done it. But Manders was always known. You ever get put in front of him and you're gone, you know? Because he, you know, regardless of what anybody says, I mean, loads of people will tell you who's been in front of him. He's already got a figure in his head. All he does <laughs> is divide that between the amount of cases, and that's how long you're getting. Um, I you know, think there should always be the. It's a strange sorry. way. Sorry, it's a strange way, you know, to go about how to give somebody uh, time, you know. But this is what the guy—the guy was known to be ruthless. I always think there should be two judges, because if you have one guy or one girl that's having a bad day, you always need somebody else to sort of back you up. You always need somebody else or somebody there to sort of has similar authority to say look i disagree with this i disagree with your decision here 
can we reflect on this and maybe uh, think about this again? Because if you have an asshole and a cunt like Manders, essentially what he's doing is he's picking on the weak and vulnerable. And do you know why they do this? That guy would have been bullied in school. He was probably a weakling. Okay. They couldn't get any women. They'd, they'd probably got drunk on two beers. That you know, you know, and uh, essentially he just takes that out in the rest of the public. Fair enough, he is, he is handing down the lot of criminals. But at the same time, a fucking heroin addict. Do you know, the guy's got issues. The guy's got problems. His son's a heroin addict. I bet his son's a heroin addict because his dad's a cunt. Do you know what I mean? Excuse my language, but that's that's essentially how why his son is a heroin addict because. His father, Manders, is the biggest prick that's ever lived. I mean, it, <laughs> you it, know what I mean? It was just biasness, you know, because of yeah. probably the way that his sons um, acted in his life and the, the thought of his son being on error. And he, he just straight away took a hating to anybody that went in front of him for drugs, um, especially those um, that he's involved. If, if you got done for street dealing of heroin and got put in front of him you know you're looking at five years but if you put somebody in front of him um i mean it was only towards the back end after the crime got committed on his house if you was a burglar it would let kind of let you off sort of thing you know give you probation or community service and mm -hmm. if you got caught with i don't know say a tenant's worth of heroin He'll sling the book at you even for that. 